Hi, so uh, thanks for the invitation. Uh, it's great to be back once again in Maryland. Um, uh, yeah, I guess I was here, here a month ago, but hopefully the audience is different enough that I can give a somewhat similar talk and not too many people will be bored. Uh, so uh, yeah, my title is uh, Holographic Encoding. Um, uh, so uh, let me start. Um, so uh, I'll start by wishing happy birthday uh, to the ADS CFT correspondence. Uh, it's 20 years old this year. It's our favorite theory of quantum gravity. Um, uh, it's not our favorite theory because um, it describes our quantum gravity. In fact, we know it doesn't. It has a negative cosmological constant. Uh, but it's our favorite theory of quantum gravity because we understand it uh, the best out of all of the you know, possible theories of quantum gravity that we know about so far. So this correspondence, um, well, you know, we, there's a lot that could be said about it. Um, uh, today I'll just mention that it has a few surprising features, um, which in recent years we've been able to understand by reinterpreting the correspondence as to the encoding map of a quantum error correcting code. Uh, so uh, in this talk, um, I'll review uh, some of these features uh, and illustrate them in a simple model. Uh, and then I'll try to generalize uh, and describe uh, what I think is a new kind of quantum error correction, uh, which seems to be the kind of quantum error correction that's suited for holography. Uh, and I call it um, operator algebra quantum error correction with complementary recovery. So it's kind of a mouthful. You know, I, I, went on the, I went on the side of being accurate with the name, but you know, it's always good. All, you know, short names are also good. That's kind of hard to remember. Um, Okay, so uh, I'll first start by telling you a little bit about ADS-CFT. I shouldn't assume that you all are experts in ADS-CFT. Um, so ADS-CFT says that quantum gravity in an asymptotically anti de Sitter space is equivalent to conformal field theory on the boundary. So the way you can think about this um, is it's like a duality between um, the soup inside of a can and the metal can. So the gravity side is the soup. So that's the interior of this cylinder. And so G Newton is not zero. That's to remember it's the gravity theory. And so if you're somebody living inside of this cylinder, since the cosmological constant is negative, it has this funny property that if, you, you know, if you're sitting in the center going up, so time is going up here, and you shine a laser away from you in this radial direction of the can, then after some time, the laser goes out and comes back to you. So if you like, you know, uh, yeah, I guess we just had a talk by an Australian. So in, so in ADS-CFT, everything is a boomerang, right? Like if you throw, you know, uh, I guess uh, a rugby ball away from you, uh, it'll uh, turn around and it'll come back to you at a time which is of order uh, the length scale associated to the cosmological constant. Um, so, so, it, so it's quantum gravity inside of the cam, this thing is. Um, so, uh, and then the claim is that um, this, uh, well here I've drawn it as a three-dimensional theory, is, is uh, equivalent to a two-dimensional theory without gravity, which just lives on the boundary of the can, which is just a local quantum field theory, although it happens to also have conformal symmetry, scaling symmetry. Um, okay, so, so I have to say a little bit more than just drawing this arrow though, so what is the statement really anyways, mathematically? Um, so th this is supposed to be a statement that's true at the level of quantum mechanics. So, um, so if I give you a state in the bulk theory on a time slice like this one, uh, then uh, it's, uh, there's an isomorphism, if you like, uh, with the Hilbert space of the boundary theory, and so each state here gets mapped to a state there, and vice versa. Um, the symmetry operators, such as the Hamiltonian or rotations, uh, also get mapped to their analogous um, partners on the other side. Uh, and so in particular, for example, the spectrum of the Hamiltonian is the same on both sides. So if you just look at the theory as an abstract quantum mechanics, it's just the same abstract quantum mechanics. Um, uh, now, that's a little bit formal. Um, a more useful or specific uh, line of the dictionary between the two sides um, is this thing called the extrapolate dictionary which says that if I have a local operator sitting somewhere in the bulk here of the gravity theory, and I take the limit of pulling it to the boundary, then through the isomorphism, it just becomes a local operator in the boundary theory, and in particular, it becomes a local operator at the point that I moved the bulk operator to. So that, that's how you see the relationship between the locality on the two sides, right? You, know, you extrapolate an operator to the boundary, and it becomes a local operator, bulk operator to the boundary. 
So I shall just say also a little bit about the interpretation of the states. So, uh, so, so, so um, you know, perturbations of the vacuum on the gravity side, you know, little ripples of the Escher drawing here, if you like, uh, get mapped to low energy excitations above the vacuum in the conformal field theory. Uh, and then um, high energy states in the bulk, which mostly correspond to, you know, having some big black hole sitting in the center here, uh, get mapped to high energy excitations of the conformal field theory. Okay, so that's ADS CFT in two slides. Um, now, uh, so, so I said I would give you some surprising features. So here's the first surprising feature. Uh, so in quantum field theory, uh, it, in quantum field theory class, you know, first day, which I, I don't know if everyone took quantum field theory class, but okay. I, well, I think quantum, inf quantum information theorists should take quantum field theory class. But anyways, if you didn't, here's what you would have learned on the first day, which is that um, causality is enforced by locality, which means that operators commute at space-like separation. Okay, clearly if you had an operator here and an operator there and they didn't commute at space like separation, right, the statistics of measuring one would depend on what you did with the other one and so that would be a telephone and you could communicate outside the light cone. So, so to avoid that in quantum field theory, we, we just, you know, need to have commutativity at space like separation. Um, so now we can think about this in the bulk, you know, inside the soup as well. Uh, so for example, consider this operator, phi of, uh, phi of x, right? I can't even read the slide from this angle that I'm at here, but I think it's phi of x, not phi of zero. Uh, anyway, phi of x in the center. Um, and uh, we can consider its commutator with some operator on the boundary um, on the same bulk time slice. So remember, time is going up here. So this disk here is a time slice. So you see in the bulk, this operator and that operator are space-like separated, right? So. So, you know, since, since we think that Lorenz invariance is pretty accurate, you know, causality seems good around us, we might think that these operators should be commuting. Um, but this is actually quite paradoxical from the point of view of trying to think about everything in terms of the boundary theory. Um, because this, so this, you know, since, since I can always push this phi of x through the isomorphism, and I, so from now on I'll always think about all the operators just in the boundary theory. This is an operator which commutes with all of the local operators in the boundary theory at a fixed time. And actually in quantum field theory, um, there's a rule that any operator that commutes with all the local operators at a fixed time has to be a trivial operator. It has to be proportional to the identity because everything is just made out of the local operators. That's, you know, that's the, the second thing you learn in your quantum field theory class is that you, know, the, you, you, know, you have the local operators and then everything else is made out of the local operators. Um, so, so think about it you know, in a spin chain just to get some intuition, right? So I, well, I don't know how many, 10 spins or something here. Um, so, I'm sure you all know that the set of all operators in the Hilbert space are generated by products of Pauli operators, right? So if you have an operator that commutes with all of the single site Pauli operators, then it's an operator that commutes with everything. Uh, and so then it's a trivial operator proportional to the identity. Um, but okay, then what's going on with this ADS CFT, right? I mean, this is just some basic structure of the Hilbert space being local, right? Being a tensor product over all of the, over the Pallys. But then, but then how am I gonna get, you know, how do I get this extra dimension to emerge, right? Like how do I, you know, somehow the correspondent seems to be demanding additional operators that somehow commute with all of these but are non-trivial. I mean, because for example, it could be us in the center, right? I don't, I don't feel like I'm proportional to the identity. Maybe I'm wrong, but I don't think so. Um, so, so somehow holography has to solve this problem, okay. Uh, now another feature of the correspondence uh, which, uh, you can also you know, understand fairly simply from the bulk side, although it's, you have to work a little harder than, than for radial commutivity, is there's this thing called the Rutaki Nagi formula, which probably most of you have heard about at this point. Um, so what the Rutaki Nagi formula says is, so consider a, a time slice here, sigma, of the boundary theory. And so for a, given the, within a time slice of the boundary theory, I'll, I'll consider a, bound, a subregion R, which I've shaded, you know, which is just say this side. Here, okay, some spatial subregion of the boundary theory. Uh, so then, um, what Ru and Takinagi proposed is well, so you know, S in the spin chain, right? We can think of this subregion as corresponding to a tensor factor in the Hilbert space, and then you know, given a state rho, we can compute the von Neumann entropy of the state rho on that tensor factor. And what Ru and Takinagi did was they gave us a formula on the bulk side 
for computing this boundary quantity, the, the von Neumann entropy of rho, uh, sub r. Um, and so what's the bulk formula? So this might not be the way you're used to seeing it, but this is sort of the modern way of writing this formula. So it has two pieces. So first of all, given r, we, the rule is through, in the bulk we find a surface gamma r, which is a co-dimension two surface in the boundary. So since we're doing two plus one here, it's just a, a, a line. Uh, of minimal area. And so here, since it's a line, a line of minimal area is a line of minimal length, and that's a geodesic. So, so we just draw the geodesic through the bulk, whose endpoints live on the endpoints of this region R. Uh, and then uh, further, we demand that this geodesic, there's some, time, there's some partial time slice here that connects it to R, which I've called chi here. Okay. So a mathematician would say we demand that gamma R is homologous to R. Um, so, okay, so then now here's the rule. So the entropy, uh, the von Neumann entropy of the state rho in this region is equal to the expectation value of the area of this surface in Planck units, A over 4G, and then there are various corrections we won't worry about. Uh, and so that's the version maybe you heard before, and maybe you didn't even hear it written with an expectation value. Okay, but we're doing quantum mechanics, so we'd better put the expectation value. Um, uh, but then there's a, also another term, which is the entropy in the bulk on this slice chi. So it's the entropy of stuff that's inside of this wedge here that lives you know, in between R and gamma R. Okay, and this wedge is called the entanglement wedge. It's sort of the, it's this, it's the sort of the universe which has as a time slice just this surface C here that connects gamma R to R. Okay, so, so that's maybe a lot for, for just one picture. Um, so let me just try to reiterate so we say given a boundary region R, its entropy is the expectation value of this minimal area surface plus the bulk entropy that's in between the minimal surface and the boundary region R. Okay. Um, now, okay. Um, so this has been checked many times. The formula is clearly correct. Uh, well, almost certainly correct, I suppose I should say, since this is a rigorous audience. Um, but, uh, you know, there were a couple of features of it which always bothered me. And actually, you know, this formula has been around for 10 years, but, you know, for nine of those years I didn't work on it because I was just sort of bothered by the formula. You know, why should this be true? Um, so here are some reasons why I was bothered. So, so given that states are dual to states, why is an entropy dual to entropy? Okay, right, I said at the beginning states are dual to states. So how can entropy be dual to something other than entropy, right? Why, does it, why do we have this funny extra term here? And actually when the formula was originally written, this term wasn't written. So then we just had this other term here and it was even more weird, right? Um, and in particular, um, to the extent that this first term is the only term, how is this formula consistent with the linearity of quantum mechanics, right? Because the thing on the left-hand side is the entropy. It's a nonlinear functional of the state rho, but this expectation value is a linear functional. Okay, so, so uh, anyways, what are we talking about, right? Uh, you know, and especially before people wrote down the correction, and even writing it down, usually we say this correction is small compared to this term, and then it's still, somehow there's some puzzle. Um, uh, and then finally, well, what are the states rho in which this is supposed to be true, right? I, I said in good states, <laughs> This formula is true, but I mean, come on, right? Uh, you know, what are the what are these good states, anyways? Um, okay, so 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 these are sort of uh, you know aspects of the Rutakianagi formula, which at least traditionally I would say were not very well understood. Um, okay. Uh, so that was surprising feature number two. So surprising feature number one, remember, was this commutativity in the radial direction. Surprising feature number two is this uh, is this Rutakianagi formula. Um, and the third surprising formula uh, feature, although maybe to you guys it won't seem surprising, um, is that there's this is the proposal this thing called subregion duality, which says that if you have um, a bulk operator phi, which is inside this wedge R. So now here I'm drawing this wedge now from above. So I'm just restricting to a time slice. So here's R, and here's this gamma R, which I forgot to label. Um, and then the idea is that um, if you have an operator phi of x in the bulk, which is inside of this wedge, then it can be represented in the CFT as an operator with support only on R. So if you're thinking about this as a spin system, it's saying you can use you know, only the spins in this subregion, and that's enough to describe whatever is going on inside of this region here. So it's called subregion duality. It's the du duality of a subregion to a subregion. Um, uh, so, 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 right, so this 5x, it can be an R, but for example, this 5y cannot. And in fact, 5y can be represented in the complement 
of R. Okay. So then this leads to some funny things. And so here's a picture I have to include in every talk that I give. Um, so so, so we can split the boundary, for example, into three regions, A, B, and C. And then we can think about this operator in the center of the bulk, phi. Um, so then, the, you know, if you draw these geodesics and you see where this, you know, shaded entanglement wedge region is, the funny thing is that um, this op it's not in the wedge of either A, B, or C. So no single boundary region has access to this operator. Um, but, but the union of any two does. Okay, and so to me, you know, that seemed very mysterious when I first heard about it from Ahmed Almiri. Um, I guess for you guys, it probably doesn't seem so mysterious. So, but let me emphasize, I mean, from a quantum field theory point of view, this is really very surprising because in quantum field theory, the spatial support of an operator is non-negotiable. You know, an operator has support in the region and that's it. You, you know, given the operator, it either, you know, its support is in one region and one region only. And you can't, operators aren't confused about, for example, whether it's a local operator here or a local operator there. I mean, they know where they are. Uh, but somehow these ones don't. Uh, and so, so for, again, from the boundary field theory point of view, that's surprising. Okay. So, so, so let me emphasize now, so all these puzzles come from trying to understand how the bulk physics is consistent with the spatial locality in the CFT, right? The idea that the CFT is like a tensor product of spins, roughly speaking, uh, site by site. Somehow that's the thing which seems to be in tension with the emergence of this bulk physics in this radial direction in the center and, and this our root Takanagi formula and so on. So, and we can say it quite pithily. So how can the same theory be local with two different space-time dimensionalities, right? That seems kind of crazy. I mean, you should know, you know theories sh you know, should have to commit to what number of dimensions they're living in, right? How can they, how can they be in two at the same time? And that, that, so that's what's illustrated by all of these paradoxes. Um, so um, the key point is that the picture I've been using of the bulk, where I have this Escher picture and you know maybe some ripples or something, I mean, this is based on semi-classical effective field theory, which hopefully you've at least heard of. Um, and it's not valid throughout the Hilbert space of the CFT for any particular bulk observable. Um, so if we go to high enough energy states, um, any given observable will always end up, it'll be far behind the horizon of some black hole and it'll be operationally inaccessible. Um, so we should really understand that our observables have a regime of validity and we only need them to have the properties we were just discussing in that regime. Um, so we'll see that by asking that this radial commutativity, Rutakinagi, subregion duality, if we ask that they only hold in a subspace of the CFT Hilbert space, then that's enough to resolve all of the problems. Um, and of course, uh, I wouldn't be here if we weren't going to interpret that subspace as the code subspace of some quantum error correcting code. Okay, so, so that's sort of the motivation slash introduction of the puzzles. Um, now, uh, you know, it would, I, I could immediately go to the general discussion of this, but I think it's helpful to first have a simple model in mind. So I guess this is also something I have to talk about in all my talks. Well, I've been starting to get away from it recently. Um, so I'm gonna take the three Q-trait code, which I'm sure you all know, uh, and I'm gonna reinterpret it as uh, the simplest example of holography. Um, so here's the three Q-trait code. Uh, you're embedding uh, one logical Q-trait into three physical Q-traits, and here's, here are the code words. Um, so, uh, so I'll just emphasize, right, this, this subspace is symmetric under cyclic permutations of the physical Q-traits, and all the states are entangled. Um, okay, so there are various ways to think about why this is a, a good code, so here's the way I like to think about it. Um, so I just note that I can always choose in this code the encoding transformation to act only on the first two of the physical q -trits. So I observe that each of these code words is of the form where I take some unitary on the first two and then I just put the, you know, the unencoded message on the first q -trit, and then I have some maximally mixed state on the second two uh, and here's the encoding map. Uh, and so, so you can do a homework problem to check it uh, if you want, uh, but I promise it works. Um, and so this means that any logical state uh, can be recovered on the first Q-trit by just acting with the dagger of this U12. Uh, 
Uh, and so then by symmetry, remember we had this cyclic permutation symmetry, it means we can also recover the state on, on the f one and three or two and three. Uh, and so, so this sounds a bit like uh, this puzzle we had before with the three regions on the boundary. Um, so uh, I can make it sound even more similar by noting that in addition to logical states, we can also have logical operators. So, so say, let O tilde just be any operator that acts within the code space with some matrix element. So if you like, this is the sort of unencoded operator here, and then we're act acting with it within the code space. Um, so in general, uh, to create logical operators, we need to use all three of the physical Q traits. I mean, if we just had some stupid subspace, right, uh, then, then we would need to use all three of the Q traits. But because we, we picked a good subspace, we can do this clever thing where we first decode, then we act with these matrix elements just on the first Q trait while it's decoded, um, and then we re-encode. And then you see all the ingredients only act on the first two Q traits. And so this means that I can, I can realize an operator with support only on the first two physical Q traits that implements any, uh, any, any logical transformation that I want. Okay. Um, and then again, using the symmetry, we can see that any logical operator can be represented on any two of the physical Q traits. Um, so so th this, is, you know, this is now getting very close to what we are seeing in ADS CFT. Um, Okay, so let's make it precise now. So here, here, here's, the, here's, here's the dictionary for interpreting the code um, as a theory of quantum gravity. Always fun to say that. Um, so the three physical Q traits are the local CFT degrees of freedom on the boundary, these three pink dots here. Um, the logical Q trait um, is a field sitting in the center of the, is it, well, it's the degrees of freedom of a field sitting in the center of the bulk. So this is like the simplest possible bulk theory, it has one lattice site. Um, so then um, the correctability that we just talked about ensures that, that we have this subregion duality, right? It says any operator acting at this point can be represented on any two of the pink dots. So if we draw these geodesics like this, then you see indeed that it can't be represented on any one, it can be represented on any two. Um, uh, so, so moreover, this, this makes this radial commutativity property kind of obvious, right? So radial commutativity would say that any operator acting here has to commute with any single site uh, operator on the boundary, but we can just check that, right? So a, say X is a single site operator on the third Q trait, and O tilde is any logical operator, and then we compute the matrix elements of the commutator between arbitrary code states, then clearly we can just take O tilde and replace it by O12 because it's always acting to the left or to the right on a code word, um, but then the commutator is just manifestly zero. Uh, and had we put here instead, say, a single site operator on one or on two, then we would have just used the other representation of O tilde, and again, we would have found that the commutator was zero. So, so it seems like that at least on the code subspace, it is possible to commute with all of the local operators uh, without actually being proportional to the identity. And of course, you know, Asking for it only on the code subspace is the key thing, right? Otherwise, you know, the puzzle we had before was a theorem, and you know, you can't have something that actually commutes with all of the single site operators and isn't trivial. So, but you can have a commutator which is zero inside the subspace that you're interested in, uh, and apparently that's allowed. Uh, now we can so that was sort of puzzle one and puzzle three. We can also consider puzzle two, the Rutakinaga formula. Um, and indeed, in this model, it also obeys something like the Rutakinaga formula. So let's see how that works. Um, so first, let's note that, so if any mixed state in the code subspace also has an encoding like this. So this is just the mixed state version of what I wrote for pure states before. So you take the mixed state that you want, the unencoded mixed state, you put it on the first Q trait, you take the tensor product with this maximally mixed chi state on two and three, and then you, en and then you encode with this U12. Um, so now let's compute the entropies, uh, right? So to check the Rutakinaga formula, we should take this, and then we should compute the entropy of the state on, you know, say any two and on any one of the Q traits, and then we should compare with what the Rutakinaga formula said, right? So let's, so let's do that. Um, so, the, so let's first say just compute the Q trait on the entropy on uh, Q trait three. So this is very easy. So we traced out one and two. We can forget about the unitaries. We can also forget about the state here, and we just half of chi. And chi was a maximally mixed state, so we have log three, right? Similarly, we can compute the entropy uh, on one and two. So again, we can dispense with the unitaries because the entropy is unitarily invariant. 
Uh, so then you see there will be two pieces. So there will be other half of chi. That gives again a log 3. But then now there will also be the entropy of this unencoded version of the state, which of course is the same as the entropy of the encoded version of the state. Uh, and this is precisely the Rutakinagi formula. If we interpret this area operator as being log of 3. Right, so if we define the area operator as log 3, then you see indeed the entropy is the entry, entropy of the area plus the entropy of the stuff inside. And I want to emphasize that in this simple example, for just one of the Q traits, there's nothing inside. Right, so that's why when we did just the third Q trait, we got just the area piece. Whereas when we did these two, we got the area piece, but then we also got the entropy of the blue dot. All right. Um, so this, you know, this I was, uh, and so, and I want to emphasize that the area term comes from the entanglement in chi. So had chi somehow been a product state, then there wouldn't have been that area term, the area term that was confusing me before. Um, so, you know, I really found this quite surprising, actually, even though it's kind of trivial, just because, you know, I'd always been a little suspicious of this Rutakinagi formula, and here you see it's just true exactly with no corrections uh, in this simple example, and that convinced me that it was something that I have to really take seriously. Um, okay. Um, now, you could say, I mean, you know, come on, Daniel, what about the rest of the states, right? I mean, you know, you told me holography was isomorphism between the Hilbert spaces, and then you just spent the last five or ten minutes only talking about a three-dimensional subspace of the Hilbert space. So come on, what, where, show, show me this isomorphism anyways, right? What about, what about the rest of the Hilbert space? You know, what about bulk locality in those states? There's, you know, there's the orthogonal complement of the code subspace. And so my claim is that, um, so this is where gravity comes to the rescue. So those states correspond to the microstates of a black hole, which is eaten the point that we were talking about, okay? Uh, and so, and then, you know, there's 24 because, you know, black holes have lots of entropy. Um, so, okay, and, you know, maybe here it just, you know, maybe I just said this and you can't really decide whether to believe me or not, but if we consider more general examples, you can see that this is really the right way of interpreting this. And so, indeed, you know, the, the idea is that, you know, this shows why gravity is really essential to having this equivalence between different numbers of dimensions, right? Like if, if we had tried to have quantum field theory in the boundary dual to quantum field theory in the bulk, we wouldn't have succeeded because the, we wouldn't have been able to escape from the paradoxes because we wouldn't have had this excuse for neglecting a bunch of the Hilbert space by saying that, oh, that's where the black holes are, right? Uh, you know, so it's gravity that gives us the excuse to demand that operators make sense only in the code subspace. Um, okay. Um, yeah. Is it because if there's an error on the code that I no longer have the symmetry of the boundary operator, and therefore it's a Um. Well. Yeah, I mean, you, so you, you do lose the cyclic symmetry. I mean, you know, in, in more complicated examples, the symmetry is a little more complicated than that. Um, but I th the key thing is that you lose the entanglement. Um, so, you know, in generic states in the Hilbert space, there's much less entanglement between these boundary Q traits than there is in the code space. Uh, and so, you know, for example, you could have product states uh, between the Q traits. Uh, and uh, in product states, you know, uh, the analog of this chi would be zero. I mean, you just, you wouldn't be able to have the sharing of the information between the different, uh, you know, one and two or two and three or one and three. Somehow the entanglement is essential for that. So, yeah, there's this slogan people, you know, wait, you know hand wave about called uh, space time from entanglement or whatever. And so th th this is, I mean, here's an equations version of that where you can actually see what's going on. Um, okay, so... So I could now generalize, you know, this can be generalized. Um, so, you know, depending on the audience, I talk about different aspects of the generalization. But, but here I, I thought it would be nice to, to say that when we really, so this is just some simple model, but when we really try to do this um, in, in the actual ADS CFT, we need a much more general formalism than just talking about Q-trits or something. Um, so let me try to describe a formalism now which is general enough to really talk about the real deal, um, which is this operator algebra um, error correction. Um, so, so let me just say first a little bit about it. So, so this was a generalization of subsystem codes introduced by these people, where um, in, you, instead of asking for a code that preserves a subsystem of the code subspace, you ask for it to preserve a subalgebra of the operators acting on the code subspace. Um, uh, and so this is a non-trivial generalization because um, uh, well, if you have some von Neumann algebra acting on the code subspace, um, it's equal to all the operators on a subsystem if and only if it has trivial center. 
but a, but a generic uh, uh, al operator algebra will not have trivial center, and so this is really a, a generalization of subsystem codes. Although it's one that I think so far, at least in this community, hasn't received very much attention. Hopefully, that's one of the reasons why I want to discuss here is to hopefully maybe see if I can change that. Um, so um, let me define concretely correctability, and I'll always just talk about erasures. So, um, so if we're given an algebra M on the code subspace, which is living inside of some larger Hilbert space that tensor factorizes, then I say that the code can correct for the erasure of A bar if every operator in the algebra can be represented as an operator just on A, acting on all code words, and I need that to be true for the operator and its Hermitian conjugate. Okay, so this is, this is the definition given in this paper uh, for the special case of erasures. Um, and, and this is basically what we were asking before, right? Sub in subregion duality, we were saying we had an operator acting on the code subspace, and we wanna, we wanna represent it just on some subfactor uh, of, the, of the physical degrees of freedom. Um, so, um, now, in fact, in ADS CFT, though, more is true than this. So there's something interesting that there's an additional constraint, which is that not only is every, so, you know, we can think of this algebra M acting on the code space as being the set of bulk operators inside of this wedge associated to a boundary region A. Um, and, and all of those operators can be represented here. That was the subregion duality we discussed before. But actually, something else is true also, which is that the commutant algebra of M which is the set of all the operators on the code subspace that commute with all of the operators in the algebra M, can also can be represented on the complementary region in the boundary A bar. So the, the degrees of freedom in the code space, space split. You have an algebra that goes to A, and you have its commutant, which goes to A bar. And so I call this um, operator algebra quantum erasure correction with complementary recovery. Right, and so this complementary recovery is this idea that either you go this way or you go that way. Um, so um, this, this situation is characterized by a theorem, which is kind of a fun theorem, so I thought I would tell it to you. Um, I won't have time to explain all the mathematics that go into proving the theorem, or even really in stating the theorem, as you'll see in a moment, um, but I'll state it anyway. So here's the theorem. So we consider this situation. We have a Hilbert space, which I'll take to be finite dimensional because I'm not a mathematician. Um, and uh, it's a tensor product into A and A bar. Okay. Uh, and then I have some code subspace living inside of that Hilbert space. And then I have some von Neumann algebra which lives on the code subspace. Uh, so then the theorem says that there are three things that are all equivalent to each other. None of them, it might be that none of them are true. But if one of them is true, then the rest of them are also true. Okay. Uh, so the first one is the subregion duality, so, uh, uh, or uh, you know, a complementary recovery. So every operator in M can be reconstructed on HA, and every operator in M prime can be represented on HA bar. Okay, that was this criterion we just discussed. Okay. Now, now let's have some fun. So, so this, this is a sort of standard quantum error correcting-ish kind of thing uh, to require. So the theorem says this is equivalent to something else. Um, which says that, well, there's some operator that's in the center of the algebra, M intersect M prime, such that for any state on the code subspace, we have the Rutak and Nagy formula. Uh, so the, the entropy on A is the area plus the entropy of the state rho on the algebra M. So that's a generalization of the von Neumann entropy to algebra, to subalgebras and not just subfactors. Um, but it's a, it's a standard thing, at least amongst uh, algebraic people. Um, and then similarly, for the complementary region, uh, using the same area operator, we have the rutak yanagi formula, but now we have the entropy on the complementary algebra. So this is the rutak yanagi formula on the complementary wedge. Uh, so, so this is subregion duality, and rutak yanagi are really the same thing, uh, sort of as a general property of error-correcting codes. Yeah. Um, now, um, and then just for fun, uh, so this is two things that are equivalent. In fact, there's a third thing that's also equivalent. Uh, this is called uh, JLMS. It's maybe a bit less well-known. Statement about relative entropy. So it says for any two states on the code subspace, their relative entropy on the region A is equal to their relative entropy on the algebra M. Uh, and similarly, their relative entropy on the, uh, on the uh, region A bar is equal to the relative entropy on the, com on the commutant algebra M prime. 
So, so, so this is sort of maybe a sort of a first sort of main theorem of this uh, operator algebra quantum error correction with complementary recovery. Right. So, let me just make a few comments. Um, so, uh, so like I already said, this this establishes the equivalence of root Takinagi and subregion duality, which is something which was not at all obvious from the bulk side. You know, I think, uh, in fact, even people were surprised by this uh, when it was first realized. Um, uh, and moreover, it clarifies several aspects of both. For example, how uh, the Rutakinagi formula works if you have superpositions of geometries or what if you have black holes in the code subspace. I mean, now using this sort of very formal but precise uh, machinery, you, you can study these things. Um, so um, I'll also comment that you know, along the way, the, the proof characterizes the structure of the encoding map. So previously we had this U12 and this chi for the Qtrit code. So, so this gives a generalization of this U12 and chi uh, for the, you know, to hold in this general algebraic setting. Um, and in particular, the area contribution to Rutakinagi again comes from non-zero entanglement and some generalization of this chi, which is here a family of states labor, labeled by the center of the algebra M. Um, okay, so then, uh, so, Good, so with this point, so I want to comment. So at some point a few years ago, I was in perimeter talking to Daniel, and uh, you know, I was excited about this operator algebra quantum error correction. And so I told him about it, and he said, oh, well, isn't that just subsystem code? And I said, no, because the center can be non-trivial. And he said, oh, but you never get anything out of that, right? And so it took me a few years, but now finally I can get something out of the, out of the center, right? So what I can get is that the theorem says that this area operator has to be in the center. Uh, the area operator that appeared in the Rutakinagi formula. So, so if I want the area operator to be an interesting operator, which I know it is in quantum gravity, it's different in different states, then the algebra needs to have non-trivial center. So, so this is an application where the, the generalization to, uh, from subsystems to operator algebras is really necessary to get what you want. And maybe there are other things like that too, although I don't currently know one off the top of my head. Um, Finally, let me comment that um, in, in proving all these theorems, there's no use of the stabilizer formalism. And so actually, uh, you know, in thinking about this, part of it, what I had to do was deprogra deprogram the stabilizer formalism out of my brain because it's, it's not general enough to deal with ADS-CFT. So we need some, you know, want to make statements which don't rely on things like talking about weights or, uh, you know, rates of uh, errors, uh, you know, this kind of, you know, doing, uh, you know, uh, syndrome diagnosis based on measuring check operators, these kinds of things. Uh, so, 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 so I somehow needed to, you know, forget all of that in order to find the right way of thinking about these things. Um, and I don't know, maybe that's, maybe that's interesting in general. I don't know if how satisfied people are with st stabilizer codes currently. Certainly they seem to be doing lots of things right, but maybe, maybe there are still other kinds of codes which are interesting, and at least here is one example. Um, okay, so, so this is the last slide. So just to mention a few things still that need to happen, I tried to aim this more at you guys. So, um, so one thing I'm very interested in is approximate versions of this operator algebra quantum error correction. So the theorem I described was an exact theorem, uh, uh, but clearly it would be good to put epsilons in it. Um, so, so there was an interesting paper. Oh, did I, mi oh, Brian, I misspelled your name. I'm really sorry. Um, it was late last night. Uh, forgive me. Um, anyway, yes, actually, I think three of the four authors are here in the audience. So, and, and so I'll emphasize that this is a very nice paper. Uh, uh, but I, I haven't totally digested it, and I'm also not sure that it completely addresses everything that I would want to know about how to do approximate versions of these things. Um, so I think probably there's still more interesting things to say about this. Um, we could also ask about generalizing to infinite dimensions. Strictly speaking, this is necessary to do ADS-CFT because the boundary is a quantum field theory and the uh, algebra of operators in a region is a type three von Neumann algebra. Uh, you know, I'm not smart enough to generalize the theorem, but uh, someone who already knows what a type three von Neumann algebra is uh, might be, uh, and I think it would be interesting uh, to find what's the analogous statement. Um, okay, then uh, another question is, well, I, I, I give a theorem characterizing um, this re a complementary recovery for a fixed choice of A and A bar. But really, this is true for any choice of A and A bar in holography, and that seems like a much stronger constraint on the code subspace. Currently, I don't 
know too much about giving a sufficient condition for that to be possible, but I think it would be an interesting uh, coding problem. Um, uh, so John and Fernando had some ideas about this, but I think still, uh, I don't know. Yeah, I feel like it's still more or less wide open. I mean, somehow, somehow I know that there needs to be a lot of entanglement in the skate chi, but I don't, I don't currently know too much else. Um, uh, then uh, there, are, there are classical versions of these codes. Uh, so these are two grad students in Germany. I don't know how they got interested in these things. But anyways, they, they somehow realized that a lot of this stuff can be used to generate classical codes. And so maybe those are less interesting to you guys, but I guess you know, a lot of the world is still classical. So maybe we can learn something about uh, classical cryptography. Um, you know, and more generally, you know, are these holographic codes uh, good for something other than holography? I don't really know. I'm mostly trying to use them to do holography, but uh, you know, it's, at least some of them are new kinds of codes, so you know, maybe they have some uh, practical benefits too. All right, thanks.